Khmer Empire, stolen and returned. Over a thousand years ago, a statue of the Hindu god of war, Skanda, was carved of sandstone and placed on its pedestal in Koh Kher, which was the capital of the Khmer Empire at the time. Depicted as riding a peacock into battle, this statue is a Cambodian artifact of major historical, religious, and artistic significance. But Cambodia was looted of many of its treasures, especially in the 1960s through the 90s, as the country was torn apart by an apocalyptic civil war. Ko Kerr and the surrounding area had their statues and treasures looted. Skanda, on his peacock, was one of them, one of many. Skanda is one name for Kartikeya, the Hindu god not only responsible for warfare, but also the guardianship of his worshippers. He can also represent both sensuality and retribution, a prominent figure in Hindu culture who grants emotional gratification. As Murugan, he is attested to in the Vedas, circa 2000 BCE, making him one of the true ancient gods of Hinduism. Skanda means to leap or attack. In the 5th century CE poem Kumara Sambhava, or Birth of the War God, Skanda is born according to the wishes of the other gods, who know he is destined to fight the three demons who may destroy them all. He is often portrayed on a peacock or pea fowl, holding a mace, sometimes with a rooster on his banner. The setting. Modern-day Cambodia is not as large as the ancient Khmer, or Khmer, or Khmer, Empire of 802 to 1431 CE, but it is defined by the same core river valley, floodplains, and delta. This is the great Mekong River, which crosses the breadth of the peninsula before spilling out into Vietnam. Ton Le Sap Lake the largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia, dominates the west of the country, and its wealth of biodiversity has given rise to many of the settlements and empires of the region. The remote Cardamom Mountains of the south, famous for their spices, and the jungle highlands to the north and east, frame a wide and open country now nearly denuded of its dense lowland forests. Its history, too has been scoured from the land in many places. But the return of these artifacts is an important step for a country still finding its way out of the trauma of the killing fields. Golden crowns, necklaces, bowls, and statuary of various sizes have been widely dispersed over the years to private buyers and museums across the globe. A single man stands at the center of this dispersal, a unique story of an epic and emblematic case of cultural theft. Douglas Latchford was once known as the world's greatest friend of Thai and Cambodian culture. He lived in the region nearly his entire life and received honorary awards from both governments. It was known that he collected artwork and artifacts of ancient Southeast Asia, and his private collection was considered the world's best. But in his final years, it became clear that he had smuggled a tremendous amount of precious materials out of the country using forged documents and shell accounts. He died in disgrace, and his daughter has announced a great campaign to repatriate all the stolen art back to Cambodia. But what was the original genesis of this great flowering of culture? Who were the ancient Khmer? How did they bring order to their forests and jungles to build some of the great cities of the world? Cambodia's Origins The ancient history of Southeast Asia has become more and more clear over the last few decades, revealing forgotten kingdoms emerging from present-day India and China and Indonesia. Native kingdoms also ruled over the centuries, forging their own identities which still echo through the cultures of Malaysia, Thailand, 
Burma, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. But even before these empires emerged, there is a growing record of how modern humans joined as many as four other members of the genus Homo when they first came to the region. According to the authors of a 2015 paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences journal, Anatomically Modern Human in Southeast Asia, Lao, by 46,000 years ago, study of ancient DNA has revealed a more complete picture of this earliest timeline. To quote, This temporal baseline for occupation of eastern Eurasia corresponds to the timing of the earliest dispersal events into Southeast Asia using genetic data. Inferences from nuclear, Y chromosome, and mitochondrial genome data support an early migration of modern humans out of Africa and into Southeast Asia using a southern route by at least 60,000 years ago. Patterns of genetic variation in recent human populations recognize Southeast Asia as an important source for the peopling of East Asia and Australasia via a rapid early settlement. In addition, the focus of hypotheses regarding early modern human migration in the region has concentrated on island and coastal regions. The fossil evidence presented here suggests that Pleistocene modern humans may have followed inland migration routes or used multiple migratory paths. What's more, the preservation of fossils in the relatively humid and swampy bioregions of Southeast Asia is obviously nearly impossible, in that hardly any skeletal remains of ancient humans have been found in the region, and those that have been found remain hotly disputed. Consider the examples of Jiren and Fuyan caves, seen by many critics of the out-of-Africa hypothesis as compelling evidence for rethinking the scholarly consensus that modern humans emigrated from Africa through the Arabian Peninsula around 60,000 years ago. In both of these southern Chinese caves, fossil remains have been discovered which appear to be those of anatomically modern humans, buried in geological layers that would place them in East Asia over 100,000 years ago. The scholarly consensus has yet to change, primarily because the genetic record still supports the models that depict an out-of-Africa emigration, and also because physical evidence like this is so scant. Also, much of the evidence found is contradictory, perplexing, or incomplete, Further north on the Asian continent in the Zhujiao caves of northern China, the oldest skeletons found there are dated nearly 125,000 years ago and are a unique combination of modern and archaic hominins, sharing elements of Neanderthal and Homo erectus cranial structure as well as Homo sapiens features, such as the composition of their inner ear. Until more significant discoveries are made that can solve these mysteries, it is safe to say that the paleo-history of Southeast Asia is a book that is still very much being written. Imagine the richness of the life on this peninsula during the Paleolithic. The great Himalayan mountain range collects all the region's moisture and returns it in the form of a number of great river systems, including the Mekong, Irrawaddy, and Sahuin. Apart from their steep and forbidding mountain ranges, much of the land is delta, prone to flooding, and thick with plant and animal life. Only during the Middle Paleolithic, in response to a changing climate, did the closed canopy cloud forest of the late and early periods change to savanna, recruiting grazing species such as stegodons and gigantic water buffaloes to the area and extirpating browsing species such as Gigantopithecus, the largest ape ever discovered, for thousands of years. But at the beginning of the Holocene epoch, the climate shifted once more and the cloud forests returned. And even before modern humans settled the region, life began to organize itself. For example, as witnessed by those who work with them, elephants were the first great road builders in the dense jungle. Their complex networks were built over generations, 
trampling the trees and vegetation that otherwise forms impenetrable walls of greenery in the lowlands. Laang Spean Cave in Batambang Province, the Cave of Bridges, holds the earliest remains discovered in Cambodia. At the deepest levels of excavation, researchers have discovered primitive stone-flaked tools of chert dating to 71,000 years ago, although even though the cave has been studied since the 1960s, it is evidently unclear who produced them. Neolithic Cultures The first proposed culture in the region is that of the Son Vi, named after a village in Vietnam where cobbled tools have been unearthed dating back over 20,000 years. At other sites, such as Con Mung Cave, also in Vietnam, a continuous record of habitation charts the progression of a number of different cultures over the millennia. During the Mesolithic, the Hoabinian culture, an umbrella term for a vast and diverse culture, inhabited Southeast Asia beginning around 10,000 BCE. The definition for the culture that archaeologists have long agreed upon is a culture composed of implements that are in general flaked with somewhat varied types of primitive workmanship. It is characterized by tools often worked only on one face, by hammer stones, by implements of subtriangular section, by discs, short axes, and almond-shaped artifacts with an appreciable number of bone tools. Hoabinian industry was much more varied and complex than that which came before, and their cobbled tools and edged weapons show a new refinement. Clay vessels have also been found from this time, some filled with the residue of wine. The scholarship of Cambodian Neolithic culture appears to remain severely lacking. Vietnam has identified multiple sites at the mouth of the Mekong Delta that form a coherent narrative of cultural progression from the Neo-Hoabinian development of the Bac Son culture to the Oc Eo, who developed along Vietnam's Mekong Delta alongside the Khmer. But there remain major gaps in the historical record of Cambodia. Giant shell middens and circular earthworks in and around the cave Samrong Sen in Kampong Chenong province hold artifacts from up to 3,500 years ago that support the proposal of a Southeast Asian Bronze Age. A profusion of tools, ceramic vessels, and jewelry, and bronze pieces may have been part of the culture that came before what the Chinese referred to as the emerging Funanese culture of Southeast Asia, which was founded in 68 CE. According to legend, the idea of a Cambodian state began when a Brahmin named Kaundinya from the ancient city of Kalinga on the Indian subcontinent arrived in the region. He is said to have been commanded in a dream to take a magic bow from a temple, although his real motivations may have been to open new trading routes. His ship was attacked by the local clan, commanded by their princess, Neang Nyak. His ship damaged. He beached it for repairs and guarded it against further attacks. But the princess admired his bravery, supposedly, and proposed marriage. He accepted and became known by the local name Priya Tong. The clan he married into was the Naga clan, an ancient lineage that claimed descent from the mythical Naga, a half-human, half-serpent, divine creature that features in many of the myths of Southeast Asia dating back at least 2,000 years. This is the official founding of the Cambodian royal line, which still exists today. An even older hymn in the Vedas, though, tells of a hermit from southern India named Kambu Swayambhuva and his consort, the celestial nymph Mera, who together formed the solar royal dynasty and founded Kambo, or Kambu tribes, whose name eventually became Kamboja. But there are many possible lines of historical evidence, including words that may have come from place names of rivers and mountains, as ascribed to them by everyone from Iranian-speaking settlers and the Romans, to the Chinese and Vietnamese. Whatever its origin, the word Kamboja, whose modern form is Cambodia, has been the name of the region for over 2,000 
years. Funan Empire What the Chinese called the Funan Empire was known locally as Vinom or Nokor Penom, in which one can see the etymological origins of the country's current capital, Phnom Pen, or Penn's Hill. Phnom refers to hills, and the people of this empire, which dominated the region as a loose confederation of tribes and clans, were therefore known as the Hill People. Angkor Bore in southern Cambodia may have been their capital, so close to the Ok Eo at the Mekong's Vietnamese Delta that there is evidence of ancient canals linking the two cities. Ancient Buddhist and Hindu artifacts have been found in the excavated city, confirming a continuous human presence there over 2,500 years. Nearby, the granite outcrop Phnom Da features the oldest surviving temples found in Cambodia, dating to the reign of King Rudra Varman, 514-539 CE. The ethnicity of Funanese people is a matter of great debate. Some scholars contend that they were the proto-Khmer, from an Austroasiatic lineage, but others believe they were the Austronesian Cham, one of the most enduring ethnicities in the region. Originally arriving from the sea, they established Champa, a string of cities and settlements along the middle of Vietnam's coast. Or perhaps the people of Funan were an indigenous culture who still live in modern-day Vietnam and refer to themselves as Khmer Krom, or the lower part of Khmer. They claim that their ancestors were the founders of Funan and also the Khmer Empire. What is even more likely is that it was a multi-ethnic state, as it is today, with representation from cultures across Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and the wider Indian Ocean. At its zenith, the Funan Empire's great king Fan Shi Man modernized the bureaucracy and built a great navy that dominated the local seas, adding ten kingdoms to his empire. Succeeding kings were influenced by the kingdoms of India, Vietnam, and China, and the political power of Funan waned. In 480 CE, its last great king, Sheyapa Mo, or Jayavarman, left the empire to his sons. Rudravarman killed Gunavarman and became the last king of Funan. The Chenla Empire of the late 6th to early 9th centuries CE continued many of the traditions of Funan. Once again, Chen La is what the Chinese writers of the time called the loose federation of states they visited. Chen La means beeswax, one of the prized trading items of the time. So this is an empire known more for its valuable goods than the might of its armies. At the beginning of the 8th century CE, these states divided into water Chen La along the coast and land Chen La further in. In succeeding decades, Water Chenla became dominated by the Shailendra Empire that extended north from the Indonesian island of Java. But the land Chenla remained independent and gave rise to the founders of the Khmer Empire. Founding of the Khmer Empire In 802 CE, Jayavarman II climbed the slopes of Mahendra Parvata north of Tonle Sap, and in a grand consecration ritual, this regional ruler from the southeast had himself declared the Hindu god king, king of the mountains, and independent of an oppressive regime he identified as Java. Whether this is the Shalendra Empire is still up for debate. Some consider it to be neighboring Champa or a different polity entirely, lost to time. But in any case, this Khmer prince had won an impressive string of military victories on his army's march up the Mekong, uniting the Khmer people and declaring himself the ultimate ruler for the region. He is remembered today in Cambodia as having broken his people free to establish a long-lasting empire. Jayavarman II was a builder. 
In some stories, he was raised in foreign Shailendra courts and returned from abroad to take command of the region, and that meant massive building projects. Clearing the jungle using elephants and thousands of workers, he united the fractured political leadership and mobilized the region to establish city after city across the north. His first capital was Indrapura, or Amarendrapuria, although its location is still disputed. For a time, he had a capital at Mahendra Parvata and finally one at Haraharalaya. The location of Mahendra Parvata has been known for some time, but it was only in 2012 that an international team used LIDAR to penetrate the dense canopy and layers of earth and to discover what lay beneath. Scanning the area from a helicopter over seven days, they discovered that 32 previously known ruins were linked by a dense grid of roads, ponds, canals, dikes, and temples, all divided into regular city blocks. Their analysis also revealed that the area suffered from intense deforestation during its time, which may have eventually led to its collapse and abandonment. Although Jayavarman II is known as the founder of the Khmer Empire, very little is known about his life. No inscriptions from his era remain. He is only memorialized by later rulers in their tributes to him. But he is thought to have lived until 835 CE, perhaps into his 80s, conquering the entire region and filling it with even more Hindu temples. His wife, according to one source, was Hyang Amrita, although others mention Queen Daran Indra Devi, who may have been the mother of his son Jayavarman III, who ruled after his death. His daughter Jestarya, whose mother was Queen Jayendrabha from Sambupura, became queen regnant over her ancestral lands upon her father's death. She presided over a funerary cult, which is mentioned in inscriptions, and she is the last known female monarch of ancient Cambodia until Queen Te in the 17th century. In Stok Kak Tom, there is an inscription from 1053 CE regarding Jayavarman II. A Brahmin named Hiranyadaman, skilled in magic and science, was invited by the king to perform a ceremony that would make it impossible for this country of the Kambuja to pay any allegiance to Java and that there should be in this country one sole sovereign. It may be true that this is revisionist history meant to justify the rule of the Khmer Empire, as kings would often extol their divine ancestors in many places and times. But the fascinating detail of this quote is in the use of the ritual to declare independence. They didn't celebrate the beheading of a rival king or the fall of a fortress. They didn't mark the beginning of the Khmer Empire with warfare at all, although there was certainly a lot of it during the era. It was the grand, sacred ritual on the peak of Mahendra Parvata that established the legitimacy of the empire. Ritual is a core element of many of the cultures of this region to a degree of rigor and complexity that outsiders may find startling. And also accounts of the regal past are heavily embroidered in visits from divine beings, magic both sacred and profane, and demons. Not much is known of the reign of Jayavarman III apart from an inscription from Prasat Sat, when he failed to capture a wild elephant while hunting, a divinity promised that he would secure the animal if he built a sanctuary, although other accounts blame the unfortunate king's demise on a wild elephant he was unable to catch. His successor was Indra Barman, who continued the tradition of large-scale building campaigns by constructing enormous reservoir and irrigation networks, as well as temples to his ancestors and the gods. He was succeeded in 889 CE by his son Yasovarman I, the Leper King, and one of the great rulers of the Khmer Empire. Yasovarman was famous for his strength. Frescoes depict him wrestling elephants and tigers. He was also very religious and obsessed with his ancestry. 
Indravarman chose his brother over him, and Yasovarman was compelled to kill his brother in time-honored tradition and take the throne for himself. But he no longer prided himself on the lineage of his father. He constructed an elaborate genealogy instead from his mother's ancestry, connecting him to the ancient thrones of Funan and Chenla. And in a further break, he moved his capital to a new city, Yashodharapura, which remained the Khmer capital for another 600 years. After Yasovarman's death, perhaps from leprosy, the Khmer Empire fractured among competing claimants for the throne. Jayavarman IV had trouble claiming more than a portion of the empire and his two nephews, first Hashavarman, then Ishanavarman II, fought to return his breakaway region of Koh Kur to the fold. Finally, in 928 CE, Jayavarman IV outlasted both and claimed the throne for himself. He briefly tried to move the capital to Koh Kur, but his successors returned the seat of power to Yashod Arapura, and stability returned. The number of cities in a census at the time growing from 12 to 24 by the reign of Rajendra Varman II in 944 CE. Jayavarman V, whose reign began as a 10-year-old in 968, ushered in a period where the empire was strongly influenced by Mayana Buddhism. His reign was also notable by the inclusion of women in important roles and positions of power. One of his trusted advisors was Prana of the Sapta Devakula clan. Other women raised funds for temples or presided as judges. The Rise of Buddhism a turbulent civil war ended with the ascension of the first Buddhist king, Surya Varman I, in 1010 CE. Known as the King of the Just Laws, his reign lasted 40 years. He and his sons fought many, mainly defensive wars against the Sri Vijaya and Tambralinga empires of India and the Champa to the east, as well as suppressing constant internal rebellion. This disorder continued through 1080 CE, when Harshavarman III succumbed to the constant attacks and the first line of kings came to an end. His successor was a usurper from the region of modern-day Thailand, who took the name Jayavarman VI and continued the dynasty. There is a sense of density to the political geography of the region, a crowding that has only grown more distinct over the millennia. Perhaps it is a reflection of the land, with its mazes of rivers and thick forests and jungles that allow for countless isolated villages and polities. Or it is a function of the rivers bringing everything always downstream. Then there is the archipelago of Indonesia and its many empires, as well as the busy empires of both India and China. But beyond all this intrigue and warfare, there is an even greater complexity in the bewildering varieties of religion in the region. The Hinduism primarily practiced by the pre-Khmer people is known as Shaivism, or a worship of the god Shiva as the creator, the destroyer, and the center of each Atman self. It is one of the most ancient versions of Hinduism predating the Vedas, originating from a southern Tamil tradition called Shaiva Siddhanta, Monks and ascetic traditions, including yoga, have many of their roots and practices in Shaivism. Buddhism didn't become a major influence in Cambodia until the 9th century CE. Of the three capitals that Jayavarman II built upon founding the Khmer Empire, Amarendrapura had a Buddhist component, dedicated to Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Although Jayavarman II was himself Hindu, he continued the long tradition of accommodation of Mahayana Buddhist teaching and worship. If it is true that he spent his youth in the court of the Buddhist Shailendra Empire, he would have had ample exposure to the philosophy and religion. These two widespread religious traditions are built on a foundation of pre-modern animism 
that still infuses the imported Hindu and Buddhist cultures with local beliefs. Elephants and tigers and serpents are common in many myths and religious texts. Holy mountains and sacred rivers grant legitimacy and divinity to rulers and their subjects. This topic of intertwined myth and religion in Southeast Asia is so deep that it is impossible to do it justice in the few moments we have. 3,000 years or more of traditions and the texts that describe them form one of the great literary historical cultures in world history. Angkor Wat In that context, we can now turn to the founding of the most famous temple city perhaps in the entire world. The UNESCO site of Angkor Wat is only one of many temples built within the capital of Yashodarapura, alongside many other temples that had come before. Originally conceived and constructed by Surya Varman II at the behest of the Brahmin Divakara Pandita, this grand temple was dedicated to Vishnu and the king himself. He ruled from its seat as a god-king, the five central towers of his temple evoking the five sacred peaks of Mount Meru, where the Hindu gods dwell. Angkor Wat features thousands of statues, including 1,860 carved Apsara celestial nymphs and bas-reliefs of Hindu myths on nearly every surface. As well as Angkor Wat, Suryavarman II was also an active campaigner, first winning, then losing a series of wars against his foes in Champa and Dai Viet, a Vietnamese precursor state. And he built even more temple cities which still survive to this day, including the huge Bang Mia Lea complex. Not even 30 years after its construction in 1177 CE, the Cham succeeded in defeating the Khmer and they sacked Angkor Wat. As it was fought over, and changed hands over the succeeding centuries, memory of Surya Varman II and his Hindu dedication of the temple to Vishnu gave way to an increasing Buddhist influence on the region and its temples. By the final declining stages of the Khmer Empire in the 13th century, the origin of the temple had already been lost to time, and it became known entirely as a Buddhist site of learning and worship. The People of the Khmer Empire Ethnically, the Khmer Empire reflected a mosaic of lineages that still exists in Cambodia today. From a 2021 paper published in Nature, an in-depth analysis of the mitochondrial phylogenetic landscape of Cambodia, the authors write, As a result of the historic expansion of the Khmer Empire in the 12th century, the majority, 96%, of Cambodia's present-day population belongs to Khmer. Indigenous minority groups of Hmong, Pong, Austronesian, and Thai are collectively known as Khmer Lu. Minority groups living in the lowlands, often among or adjacent to Khmers, include Chinese, Vietnamese, and Cham. Austroasiatic languages are predominant in Cambodia, being one of the most ancient language families in Eastern Asia. Austroasiatic is also spoken in India, Bangladesh, and southwestern China, implying that the Austroasiatic-speaking populations may represent the descendants of the earliest settlers of modern humans who migrated from Africa and entered into Eastern Asia about 60,000 years ago. The last great builders of the Khmer were the kings Jayavarman VII and Indravarman II, but their structures were less refined than the glorious achievements of the past. Perhaps they had less access to a class of artisans, or the destabilization of the empire had finally eroded their culture to a point where they couldn't quite realize the same visions as their ancestors. Jayavarman VII was the empire's first Buddhist king, who made it his mission to alleviate the suffering of his subjects by building hospitals and roads, and as always, more temples. His son, Indravarman II, left few details of his reign, mainly because his successor, Jayavarman VIII, was a resolute Hindu, who destroyed the works and Buddhist culture of his two predecessors. 
It was during the reign of Jayavarman VIII that the Mongols arrived in 1281, attacking what was then called the Angkor Empire. Jayavarman imprisoned the first Mongol emissaries, leading to an inevitable attack, which he sensibly decided to end with a promise of fealty and tribute. But that didn't save him from another devastating invasion by the post-classical Sukhothai kingdom from the west. Although the monarchy survived these defeats, his dedication to Hinduism did not. His son-in-law Indravarman III claimed the kingdom upon his death and made Theravada Buddhism the state religion for the first time. Conclusion The Cambodian royal line continues on into the present day. But our focus on antiquity and the Middle Ages ends our story on them here. These are the ancient empires whose treasures were looted from Cambodia in colonial and post-colonial times. We went to Cambodia in 2014, visiting my sister-in-law doing a two-year stint as a Peace Corps volunteer in Kampong Chenang. She introduced us to the family hosting her the father, a prominent member of the community who had been a lieutenant colonel in the Khmer Rouge during the 70s, when they sent as much as a third of the country to their deaths for ideological reasons. To me and my wife and daughter, he and his wife were gracious and kind, the sins of the past far behind them. We lived for a week in the jungle of Mondulkiri with Cambodian elephants and their rescuers, learning how inextricably linked the history of these giants of the jungle is to the development of the entire region. We visited Siem Reap and Angkor Wat and Koh Kerr and marveled at the endless bas-relief depictions of Khmer court life and battlefield exploits. But throughout our time there, what struck us most about the Cambodian people was their love of ritual. Weddings were the most central function in the entire country. My sister-in-law's host mother made the most beautiful beaded wedding dresses. We had trouble understanding at first, then realized that these ceremonies offered positive spaces where families could gather and heal the wounds that the country still suffered. Like Jayavarman II climbing the holy mountain Mahendra Parvata to declare himself God King, the rituals of Cambodia eventually bring peace to the killing fields. <laughs>